food resuscitation are a practical concept that we learn in medical school that we forget about as we move through our academic world. When you get to the clinic, however, this is a very important and very applicable concept that is needed when we treat our patients. But before we get started on the types of fluids and when they're used, it's important to note and to remember three important terms, and those are the terms of tonicity. So that would be isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. First and foremost, it's important to note that these terms are what we call relative. So we measure the tonicity in relation to another value. In this case, we use the tonicity of the plasma in our body as the relative value, and we measure everything based off of the tonicity of our body plasma. So for example, isotonic. Iso means same. So isotonic solutions will have similar or the same tonicity as our plasma volume or our plasma fluid, excuse me. For hypotonic solutions, it's the opposite. These solutions have a lower solute concentration than our body's plasma. And with hypertonic solutions, as you can guess probably, these solutions have a higher concentration of solute as compared with our body's plasma. So these are important terms to remember and to review because we control, therefore, the movement of the fluid between the body compartments as a result of their tonicity. So if you guys go back to that picture of that red blood cell in a container, right, you remember that a hypertonic solution causes crenation because the water flows out of the blood cell into the extracellular fluid space. And then if you have a hypotonic solution, the red blood cell swells up because the water flows from the outside, so from the extracellular into the intracellular compartment. So that's why you get that big, big red blood cell. And then an isotonic solution, when you place that RBC in there, it just remains the same because it's exactly the same. It remains a balanced um, ICF and ECF. So those are just some concepts that you wanna review if you haven't already, and we're gonna keep going. So the first thing, in general, there are two kinds of IV fluids that are used at the hospital. First would be the crystalloids, and then second would be colloids. Our crystalloids are our most commonly used within the hospital setting. They are water-based solutions or aqueous solutions, all of which have varying electrolyte composition. So these crystalloids are used mostly to increase vascular fluid volume. And you would choose the crystalloid that you are using based on the electrolyte composition as well as the patient status. So if the patient has specific pathologies that, you know, ha create like electrolyte deficiencies, etc., you could choose a crystalloid essentially that would help you to alleviate or fix those deficiencies. Colloids on the other hand are high molecular weight fluids. They remain confined in the intravascular space, so they cause a shift in the oncotic pressure. They are used as fluid volume expanders. The way that I try to remember this is a crystalloid is more like water. Colloid, as a word to me, sounds heavier. So I always think um, volume expanders because they cause a bigger shift in a shorter amount of time. So you're thinking like large molecules here, like your proteins, your dextrans, your gelatins, things like that, which we'll discuss further on. So things you want to consider when you want to give IV fluids are if you need to replace free water deficit, if you have ongoing fluid losses like bleeding, diarrhea, vomiting, you can replace with IV fluids. If the patient is at the hospital and they just need to be maintained on IV fluids, so that's maintenance fluid therapy, if they have an electrolyte imbalance like we said before, and also as a solvent or vehicle for IV drug administration. So there are certain drugs in that we administer that are what we call caustic, and the, that means that they're, they can or have the ability to damage the veins. So we administer them via IV or mix them with fluid in order to ease the way, I guess, that we administer them, like make it a little bit easier for the patient, less painful, but also because they require a vehicle or a solvent in order to be more efficiently administered. So that's something that we want to consider as well. So the best thing to look at for these IV fluid 
compositions, which I guess I will go over, but there is a great table in Schwartz's Principles of Surgery. It's the 11th edition, volume one, chapter three. It's a table 312 for electrolyte solutions for parenteral administration, and it's fantastic. So we're gonna talk about, if you want to write this down, please do, but I'm just gonna go over um, quickly some of the major differences between each of the solutions. So first, your ECF. Um, it generally has an osmolality of 280 to 310. So that is your quote unquote normal. That's what you're want, gonna wanna be looking at when you're picking solutions that are isotonic. So things like lactated ringers with um, osmolarity of 273, sodium chloride, 308, so that's NaCl or normal saline. And then you have also D5 water which has glucose in it, so that has an osmolarity of 253. And then another fluid called plasmolite is the closest to the composition of the human body, and that has an osmolarity of 295. So all of these fluids have varying levels of sodium chloride, potassium, bicarb, calcium, and magnesium, which make them ideal or not ideal for specific situations. So the electrolyte composition is something that we consider when we want to decide what to give our patient. So with isotonic solutions, again, we have the plasmolite, lactated ringers, D5W, and normal saline. We use these mostly for GI losses, extracellular volume deficit. Lactated ringers is slightly hypotonic because it contains lactate, and this is because it's used to make it more stable during storage. So basically lactate causes a greater stability within the fluid, which allows it to be stored for longer. Sodium chloride or NaCl or normal saline is ideally used for volume deficit associated with hyponatremia, hypochloremia, and metabolic al alkalosis. So you can see that these, um, that specific, you know, our usual NS is really used for mostly volume deficit, especially with regard to, you know, the electrolyte imbalances with sodium and chloride because of the fact that it does have um, a higher, uh, I guess, like concentration of sodium. In addition, you want to remember that fluids are not just, it's not like you're just giving water. Um, you're technically giving a drug in the sense that you have to consider that there will also be complications as a result of you giving these fluids. So with sodium chloride, you want to consider that it's mildly hypertonic because it has an increased amount or increased concentration of sodium balanced with also an increased number of chloride or increased concentration of chloride. So this increases the chloride load on the kidneys, which can lead to a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So that's the major complication of sodium chloride. With plasmolite, though it's the closest to the composition of human plasma, it contains small quantities of potassium. This is usually negligible, but we still want to use this drug or this fluid in patients with caution, in patients with renal impairment or risk for renal impairment. As far as D5W, so dextrose 5% in water, that's what D5W stands for, this has to be used with caution in diabetic patients because it can cause hyperglycemia. And finally, with lactated ringers, again, we mentioned before that it does contain lactic acid, so it can cause lactic acidosis in those with liver failure. And we have to remember that if we are giving blood products, so if the patient needs a transfusion, we cannot use lactated ringers concomitantly with the transfusion because it will cause clumping of the blood product. So those are just some of the complications that can be experienced in infusing these solutions. Next, we move on to the alternative resuscitated fluids. So these are the fluids that we were talking about earlier, the colloidal fluids. And I'm just gonna go through each one of them and give you guys a brief overview and a description. Again, there's a great table in Schwartz um, 11th edition, volume one, chapter three, it's table 313. And it goes through each of the fluids and their molecular weight, their osmolality, as well as the amount of sodium that they contain. So it's something that you would be I guess behoove you to review um, as much as possible. So it's a great little table. Um, it's also on our PowerPoint slides. So the first hypertonic solution that I wanna talk about is hypertonic saline solution. So there are two types of hypertonic saline solution, also known as HSS. It's 3.5% normal saline and 5% NaCl. So 3.5% NaCl, 5% NaCl. 
So these can be used for corrections of severe sodium deficits, as well as treatment for closed head injuries. However, there is an increased risk for bleeding because they act as arteriolar vasodilators. And of course, if you remember, and I'm sure you do, that a rapid correction of any sort of hyponatremia with a saline solution or a hypertonic saline solution can cause osmotic myelinolosis. So that's something that we want to remember. Hypotonic solutions, however, which are basically 0.45 NaCl, so that's called half normal saline or half NS. This can be used to replace free water deficit, and it was used in the past as a maintenance fluid for pe the pediatric population, but it's no longer recommended. So just remember that you can use this to replace free water deficit in some instances. However, the complications are pretty dire. Um, it can cause cerebral edema and pulmonary edema in these patients or in, in general when you infuse them. Now, when we move on to our colloidal solutions, there are four main types, and these are albumin, dextran, head of starch, and gelatins. So it's important to note that albumin and dextrans, these are naturally occurring, and then head of starch and gelatins are synthetic. So we use these heavy fluids to confine to the intravascular space uh, molecular weight. So these are more efficient transient plasma volume expansions, but um, they don't last very long. So it's kind of, again, it's transient plasma volume fluid expansion. So if we wanted something that was going to expand our volume right away, like for example, for a very a severe burn patient or for someone who was completely volume um, kind of hypovolemic, we would start off with a, um, probably with an albumin or a dextran. In the case of our burn patients, we start off with albumin and then we can use them in conjunction with crystalloids like normal saline um, or lactated ringers to help continue and maintain that expansion of the volume. So some complications when we use colloidal solutions, they can cause um, worsening edema and impaired tissue oxygenation in situations or in instances where the patient has already going through severe conditions like hemorrhagic shock or sepsis. So because these conditions cause an increase in capillary permeability, the colloids are then allowed to enter the interstitial spaces, which pulls water into those interstitial spaces, worsens edema, therefore worsening tissue oxygenation or impairing tissue oxygenation. In addition, it's important to note that they are significantly more expensive and once again, they are sometimes used in conjunction with crystalloids to help initially expand the volume and then maintain that volume expansion. So going into some specific colloidal solutions, first I'm going to talk about albumin. This is one of the natural occurring ones used specifically in severe burns and also hypoalbuminemic states. It can be used in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, acute lung injury, diuretic resistant nephrotic syndrome and plasmapheresis as an exchange, um, kind of an exchange fluid. So with albumin, it the volume will remain expanded for 16 to 24 hours. So you can um, use this initially and then you would kind of give a NS or a lactated ringers in order to, again, balance that out. With dextrans, these are highly branched polysaccharide molecules, and we use them to improve microcirculatory flow in surgical reimplantation. So basically what we're seeing here is that if we had like a, I guess like a graft or any sort of microsurgical reimplantation, we could use this fluid to improve like vascular flow um, in those smaller vessels. In addition, it also helps us to prime the extracorporeal circulation during CPB, um, cardiopulmonary bypass. So what they mean by extracorporeal circulation is that it helps to prime the machine, the tubing that is used to you know, pump blood during the time that cabbage is ongoing. So these help us to expand volume for approximately 6 to 12 hours. With gelatin, this, this is a synthetic um, colloidal solution synthesized from or by collagen hydrolysis. We use it with acute management of hemorrhagic hypovolemia. Uh, 
we prime the extracorporeal circulation again in cabbage, and we also can use it to preload our patient's volume before regional anesthesia. And this is the shortest acting solution. It remain, helps the volume to remain expanded for less than six hours. With hydroxyethyl starch or head of starch, it's derived from aminal pectin. It's a highly branched starch. Um, there are specific uses like acute management of hemorrhagic hypovolemia, and this helps to expand the volume for 8 to 12 hours. And finally, um, I just want to talk about real quick things that you should consider when administering IV fluids. So you want to determine the type of fluid to be used, and when you're doing this, you want to make sure you're aware of the volume status of the patient, the severity of the concentrations of solute in their plasma, as well as the composition of the abnormality present. And what I mean by this is basically, know whether or not your patient is normal volemic, hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypovolemic. And then also note whether or not they have any deficits with regard to their electrolytes. Um, make sure you check their labs and whether or not, you know, they have things, um, certain deficiencies that need to be corrected. So that will help you determine the type. Also consider comorbidities of the patient. So if the patient is hypertensive, if the patient has CHF or any sort of renal issues, and as well as other pathologies that can contraindicate the administration of IV fluids. Again, automatically what comes to mind in these cases are like things like CHF and renal problems. These are the kinds of patients that you would not want to overload with fluids. So that is something to keep in mind. Can you use something else? Um, is there a way to give them a bolus without really providing them with maintenance, like, or can you titrate the rate to a lower rate? So these are things that you want to consider um, in these patients before you prescribe or order their IV fluids. So I hope this helped. That was just a quick review of IV fluids and fluid resuscitation. Make sure you check Swartz. It's a great resource for this chapter three. It's just a short section, and I hope you guys are studying well and staying safe. So this is Danny with Up to Doctora podcast and happy studying. Thanks guys.